Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! Okay, so this isn't a recent story and occurred during the pandemic. A few things to note, my next door neighbor is the wealthiest person in the neighborhood as far as we know. Before the pandemic, he was a reasonable guy and I never had a problem with it. Till a certain party that got a little out of control, but for context, I will start the story before that day. This neighbor, who we will call Jack, lives in the house next door to mine with his long-term girlfriend. Let's call her Stacy. She is a gem of a person. Since before my father-in-law gave his house to my wife, he would hold crazy parties at his house. These parties would happen every weekend. He invited us to one when he moved in, and we went to be polite but it wasn't our thing so we politely declined. He was still a reasonable guy I would say, come on we'll have a blast, but the wife and I would use our kids as an excuse and politely decline. He converted the first floor of his house into a nightclub complete with an indoor swimming pool. One party will always stick out to me as the day we saw a tow truck remove a car from a brick wall. The driver was okay, but the party itself was massive. It looked like he invited the entire town. The next day he asked me if I would help him move a couch. The couch was thrown into the pool. I helped and we had a laugh about it. As I said, even with some of the wildest parties, not a bad guy. He at one point helped me clear out some trees that fell in the woods behind our houses. It was a pandemic that caused him to go off the deep end. My town was part of the worst of the pandemic. The schools shut down before the orders from the state. Many businesses did the same. Jack, however, did not stop his partying. His parties were shut down several times until one day, it looked like the entire police force showed up. They arrested everyone. They were all let go but the parties were over and a good fun loving guy was gone. He organized the protest with his friends and got a bunch of others who hated masks and went to the town hall. It was closed and they tried the county office. For some unknown reason, they went after a supermarket and harassed the workers. I think it was on Facebook and YouTube, but I may be confusing it with other such protests. Why these people choose to harass grocery stores is beyond me. Well, he ended up getting arrested again. We were still on speaking terms at this point. That would change when he and the buddy of his decided to race their overpriced cars through town. We got into a hated argument about it, and he took offense when I pointed out that the only reason he isn't in jail is that he's rich. Not my proudest moment. More recent events include calling the police on anyone that is having work done on their house, calling the police when anyone parks on a street, sending lawyers to town hall to disrupt the meeting, and most recently parking 10 junk cars on the street with flat tires, wrapping a chain around a piece of construction equipment and putting up a very vulgar sign. Oh, and his girlfriend usually comes over to apologize for his actions. I am surprised that she hasn't broken up with him yet. She is the one to apologize for his actions and will offer to pay for any damages. They are still together from what I know, but I haven't seen her in a few weeks. My neighbor is a pinnacle of the entitled rich a-hole, in my opinion. Think this is best here, but will happy redirect elsewhere if otherwise. As much as I love traveling, I hate airports. The issue is having various bits of metal inside my body caused by a rather well-known incident in the UK in 2005. At the time this happened, 2017, I also had a temporary stoma to enable part of my intestinal tract to rest given the strictures and inflammation caused by the incident and ulcerative colitis. This meant I had an external opening on my stomach to allow waste to leave my body into an external bag. I was traveling through one of my local airports with a sunflower lanyard, a rather discreet way that some UK airports use to identify those who may have a few issues progressing through the airport but may not need to be physically accompanied or assisted. It was early morning and I had changed the bag before I left the house. And as usual, I was being a little gassy. 
It's easy enough to just open it slightly and gently press to release it. Stressed by the early flight and the late arrival of the taxi, I'd done this numerous times to reduce the bulge the air caused. I was at security and had all the usual items on the table to be scanned. I explained to one gentleman who saw the lanyard about the various metal bits inside me. He nodded and asked if I preferred the wand or a gentle pat down rather than the full body scanner. Not being a fan of overly enclosed spaces, I said the wand would be fine. Each time it beeped over a problem point, I explained. I ate that's the nail and plate in my shoulder. That's the pocket change embedded by my hip and so on. He nodded. He smiled and let me proceed to wait as my carry-on bag was being scanned, along with other various items like belt, shoes, a wallet, as is common in airports nowadays. Waiting at the scanners, I was gently tapped on the shoulders and told by a rather bossy and aggressive young chap I've been selected for a further check. I smiled and nodded and stood to one side. He asked all the usual questions and then promptly and roughly started patting me down. I complained. He said shut up, that he's allowed to do whatever he wants, and by this time Stewie, the stoma, decided that he's had enough. I hadn't had coffee or breakfast yet, so all I was doing was passing air when he thrust up my arms in the air. I yelped in pain as one arm due to injuries doesn't generally go much higher than shoulder level and complained loudly that it hurt. Lifting my arms also lifted my t-shirt and revealed the bag. I quickly pulled down my shirt as no one really needs to see it. He loudly proclaimed, all bags need to be scanned, not heading on your body. Take it off now. I adjusted the lanyard and explained quietly that I will not remove a medical device in public. He scoffed and demanded I remove it or he would arrest me and bar me from flying that day. By this time we had drawn a crowd, including two other agents, one of whom was his boss who had used the wand on me before I had a chance to explain. He told everyone loudly I was refusing to obey the rules and complained during the bad down and I had a hidden bag which needed to be scanned. I explained that he was roughly handling a person with disabilities, that I had hurt my shoulder when he thrust my arms up and now he was demanding I remove a medical device. By now the whole line had come to a standstill while watching the early morning show. The boss asked if he could use the offending bag. I lifted my shirt again and the boss smiled and said that was enough. The kid demanded I remove it to be scanned or he wouldn't let me pass. The boss said I could go as soon as my stuff had finished scanning, but the kid put his foot down and grabbed my arm trying to spin me around, trying to get at Stewie. I pushed him away. This time, the kid exploded. I thought to hell with it. I'm not gonna get coffee or breakfast at this rate before the plane. Why not? So I said in my loudest voice, You wanna see the bag? Fine. Then show me yours too. He looked at me in shock. So I reiterated, Show me your bag here and now and then you can see mine. I haven't asked me, you idiot. Didn't you see the lanyard or did you just ignore it thinking you were better than everyone because of your uniform thinking it gives you carte blanche to treat people nastily? Your boss understood and was willing to let it go, but you weren't. I want your name and staff number, and I can guarantee by the end of the day your arse will be raw given the fire I'm about to light under it. His boss took him away. I calmed down and got on my flight, with one older lady coming up to me patting me on my arm saying I did a good job and her stoma is called Sally. My response with a smile was, Stewie thanks you for your support. Over the course of the day, I spoke to the airport, the security contractors, and a border agency. They checked footage and found I wasn't the only one he'd given issues to. A week later, I got a letter from them apologizing and giving me vouchers for other flights and that that kid had been dismissed. Two or three months later, I'd had almost forgotten about it. And the embarrassment too. And that's when I was out in a bar with friends when a now slightly inoperated kid approached me and try kicking off with his mates, telling me I was gonna pay for losing him his job and that he was gonna make me pay. He tried punching me, but I moved and he hit a middle post. Two pouncer friends arrived, saw him squealing like a pig 
and asked me about what happened. I reminded them of the airport story. They chuckled. This is a kid and he just tried punching me. I stepped aside, so he hit the post. They called an ambulance and barred him. Stewie was disconnected in 2018 after nearly two and a half years. The colitis hasn't really caused any major issues in the last couple of years, thankfully. This is not directly my story, but I did help with the malicious compliance part of it. So my best friend had moved out of state with her family for several years. She was never really happy there as she is a small town country girl in a big city. So when her marriage dissolved, she decided she needed a change. She was homesick but didn't want to go back home. She wanted to live close enough that she could visit often and she wanted to be in a similar setting to home. While on a camping trip, she fell in love with a small town that was about 5 hours from her children's father and about 6 hours from her hometown. Looking around the town, she finds a small house that's for rent and she decides to reach out to the owner about the details. It is not a great house, it looks terrible, hence why I call it the crack shack, but nothing that some hard work and a little bit of money couldn't fix. The landlord tells her that the house is livable, but it's definitely a fixer-upper. It's been vacant for a while and they just recently had a man that kept breaking in at night, but assured her the cops were aware and the guy hadn't been back in months. However, he had done a lot of damage. He was willing to make a deal with her. If she was willing to pay for supplies, he would reimburse her. And if she would do the work on the house and pay all of the utilities, he wouldn't charge her rent until the repairs were complete. He would also draw up legal documents that if she decided she wanted to buy, he would sell it to her for $15,000. As in its current state, it wasn't worth more than that. She thought it over a bit and insisted on having the legality of it all taken care of prior to moving in day. And he agreed. Over the next few weeks, paperwork starts flowing in. She reads it, signs it, and sends it back. Before she can move in, she needs to make a couple of minor repairs, plumbing issue, a damaged ceiling, and two broken doors. She does this, sends him the receipts, registered mail, and keeps a copy for herself. A few days later, she gets a notification that he signed for the letter. A week goes by, then two, and three, nothing. She tries to call him, but with no answer. He emails, sends a letter, nothing. A neighbor tells her the guy is having health issues and has been in the hospital, so for sure that has to be the holdup. So she moves in on schedule and continues repairing the house. Fast forward a year and she has cleaned up the junk dump yard, replaced all the doors and storm doors, repaired several windows, plumbing, electrical, replaced the hot water tank, repaired the furnace, and the supplies have arrived to fix the roof. And guess who finally appears in her email then? The landlord pops up and explained he has been in and out of the hospital but he has received all of the receipts and photos of the work and that everything looks good then he'll be in touch. So she starts getting together a team of friends who all have experience in roof work. The day before they are supposed to start, another email comes. After speaking to my attorney, I have decided that you have been squatting in my house for one year without having paid any rent. The amounts on your receipts are unreasonable. I won't be repaying you for the work you have done. I will forgive the first three months of your time there and this should more than compensate for the work already done. Not even close to the cost of supplies. You have 15 days, which is the minimum notice allowable in her state. You have 15 days to pay the sum of $9,000 or move. If you refuse, legal action will be taken. So she replies reminding him of the lease she signed and the agreement they made. He responds with, my lawyer has no record of a lease on file. When he sent your copy to you, the post office returned it so technically it is null and void if I say it is. Prove that we ever made this agreement. So she dug through her records and sent him copies of every email he sent her, laying out the terms. Thinking he's older and has been having health issues, maybe he just doesn't remember. He comes back with, I don't remember any of that. She also had saved voicemails that he had left on her phone 
including one where he says we received your signed lease. You can not start the repairs and move in when you're ready. Don't forget to send me all the receipts related to home repairs. He offers up a compromise of, I'll eat off the full cost of repairs and pay all the utilities. I'll pay a reduced price in rent to compensate me for my time and money put in. She even made an offer that she would eat the cost of the repairs and start paying rent going forward, but asked that he accept the work already done to compensate her for the repairs already made. Which even this was a deal where the landlord made out better as she had put more money into everything at this point and she only made repairs according to a previously agreed upon list. Well, we can certainly try to work out a new deal, but I'm still not paying these receipts. You're going to start paying rent. If you want to buy the house, it's going to be $37. In this area, even after the repairs, you'll be lucky to sell it for this. She tells him she needs to think about this offer, but she doesn't. She calls me as I can be creative. I told her first to talk to a lawyer, she did, and while the lawyer thought with all of the correspondence she could probably win a case, she decided the house wasn't worth it to her. So she called the landlord back and told him after careful consideration, I'm going to have to decline this offer as I wouldn't have agreed to it before moving in. He then tries to negotiate another deal, still a horrible one, still didn't include repayment of any sort for the work she put into it. Since this is his final offer, accept it or get out. And this is where I came into the story. Since he was unwilling to pay for their repairs, I sat down and made a list of everything she had done to that house and devised the following plan. One by one, she and the team that was supposed to help fix the roof went through the house and unfixed everything she had previously repaired. The new doors were removed, the old ones were still stored in a garage, and took down all the drywall she had put up but had not yet finished. Removed all pipes, fittings, fixtures, appliances, and every last jingle that was meant for the roof, and made a few calls and sold every bit of it to a family friend who happened to be in need of some home repair of his own. A month after she was gone, she received another email from him insisting that she pay up or move out. And this is when she replied with, I'm sorry, our business concluded a month ago when I moved to the next town over. No need to pay me back for my hard work on your house, as I had removed everything that I paid for in order to recoup my cost. I left the house in precisely the same condition as I found it, minus the several dumpsters full of garbage I had to remove from the house and property before I could even begin the repairs. According to my calculations, this fact alone should bring us even up. That was a year ago. Once in a while, she still gets the random email from him insisting she owes him money. But she no longer replies. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.